on YouTube, everyone is so trigger happy to like click away to the next video that you really, in the, in the first 15 seconds of the video, have to affirm for the viewer somehow that what you clicked on, the value you clicked expecting to get will actually be delivered in this video. If they click the title and thumbnail expecting one thing and then 30 seconds into the video, there has been no confirmation that that's gonna be a part of this video or it's taking too long to get there or something, people will click away. So you definitely need to make the first 15 seconds tie into the title and thumbnail. And so I usually recommend people start before they even shoot the video, they know what the title and the thumbnail is going to look like and then they shoot the video, the first 15 seconds specifically, with that title and that thumbnail in mind so they can make the, all three of those things kind of work and complement each other. From Toronto, Phantom Media presents the Not So Corporate Podcast. Hello there, it's Mark Drager, the host of the Not So Corporate Podcast. Welcome to this very special episode. I'm going to say that every week. It's a very special episode. Um, I'm also joined here in the studio with Leah Earl. Hey, Leah. Hello. And as well, Roland Echeverria. Howdy. <laughs> What was that, cowboy? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, in this episode, we're, we are going to be joined with Tim Schmoyer, who is a YouTube creator expert. He's the guy that everyone turns to on YouTube when they want to figure out how to be good at YouTube. Uh, we had a great conversation with him, and we really dug deep into not only just the technical side of YouTube, but just, just help people understand if you're trying to create stuff for that community, what are you doing? And, and what is your purpose, and what do you stand for, and all of these great things. So I hope you'll stick with us to listen to that. And then after that, we have... Um, our catch-up time where we work through a few topics including uh, is pluto uh, a planet or not uh, did the the moon landing actually happen Emojis. and 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 a really really riveting um actually it was discovery it was, it was a discovery on leah's secret secret emoji <laughs> communication style dun, so all dun, that dun, coming dun. up on um, this uh, episode of the not so corporate podcast So as I mentioned, we're joined with Tim Schmoyer, and uh, Tim Schmoyer is someone who is in who is a professional YouTube creator. Now, if that's a newer term to you, you may not you you know you may consider YouTube as something uh, in one of kind of the four categories. I think I think most people use YouTube certainly to to go and watch content, so they tend to consume content there. Now, some people choose to make videos, and they or they're in a company or they're a marketer, and they think, well, let's put you know let's put the video on our website, let's put it on YouTube. So they use YouTube as a distribution channel, just someplace to host it. And then there are marketers who, who are maybe a bit you know, more savvy or at a bit larger companies where they could put paid kind of placement behind their videos. So they're not only using it, they're not only using YouTube as a distribution, but they're using it as a way to market out to their communities. Now, there's this fourth group of people who are, who are called YouTube creators, and they're people who, in fact, um, create most of the content that we all watch, and we may not even realize that these are people who who can potentially make a living. They can. Th this is their full time career. They are creative people. They're 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 YouTube creators who are producing content solely for the purposes of YouTube to to build an audience and to and to make a living off of it. And and why I'm so excited to have Tim on today is because he is the guy that most people turn to when they want to figure out how to get into this world. So listen, Tim, thanks so much for joining us and yeah, uh, and welcome. Thanks for having me. So w would you would you think that do you, would you agree with my assessment in terms of how of how maybe more the corporate world considers YouTube versus the world that you spend all day every day in and the people you're you're surrounding yourself with? Yeah, I mean, I, when I talk with the corporate type people um, and even people who are involved in YouTube but are like corporately involved in YouTube by like they're running big networks and they're running big uh, companies that are built uh, I, like even then it makes me scratch my head sometimes like we see this platform very very differently <laughs> you know and uh, like the advice that you give is totally different than the advice I would give you know so it's uh, even on the platform there's a lot of uh, a, a lot of room for a lot of different people and styles and things. Well, and that's what I find so exciting because because you know where we were a few years ago, where I like I was a few years ago, is well, YouTube is a great place to to put stuff and not have to pay for hosting, and yeah, and I, I think that's like in, in the simplest form, and mm -hmm. and then you have people who want to put stuff into YouTube, but but kind of ignore the whole 
or not ignore, but maybe they're just not aware of the impact of the whole social network side yeah. of YouTube. And I know that you have expertise in other video platforms as well, but focusing just on YouTube, there's this whole social world, social beast. They think Facebook is social media. They think exactly. Twitter yeah, is. Yeah, most people think of Twitter, Facebook, sometimes Pinterest, sometimes Tumblr, you know, but the, the big ones. And then they don't think of YouTube as a social media platform and they miss a lot of the potential that it has. So looking into your background, um, you know, you're YouTube certified, which is which is really a cool thing. You know, mm-hmm. I've done a bit of stalking on you so i know that you went you went to california <laughs> I put plenty of it out there so it's fine it's not called stalking if i gave it to you right? well we we yeah we we dug deep let's it's just say research. That. we watched some videos <laughs> we watched some of your videos so you went out to california did the training but i also know you know through some stalking on linkedin that you have quite a pretty kind of diverse background so how is it that you yeah. put yourself in a position where you're an expert at this that is a good question uh so Let's see here. I yeah, all my background is in uh, youth and family work in faith-based contexts, and uh, so I was working with a lot of families, a lot of teenagers, um, doing stuff like that, working through different churches and things. And I liked it because I liked seeing the difference it made in people's lives. Like I like seeing relationships that were broken at home like start to heal. You know, I like to see teenagers really start to connecting with their parents again. Like I liked seeing that type of life change and that's like what really motivated me to, to keep going. Make a long story really short, 2000, it was March 2nd, 2006, my, uh, I uploaded my very first video to YouTube. It's super quick, short 30 second video. I called it test video. So, you know, I put a lot of effort into this thing. And uh, just to kind of see what the process was like. And my uh, girlfriend at the time and I, we were uh, were dating and we were just making videos of, of us on dates, hanging out, going to the park, eating at restaurants, you know, just to kind of share with friends and family because I was in grad school at the time. And our engagement, that's still up there. Our wedding, um, our honeymoon. It's creepy. I've seen all these. (laughs) I know. Don't don't say it's creepy. It's not creepy. If you enjoy it and they put it out there, that's not creepy, right? (laughs) Yeah, well, here we are, we're like a thousand some videos later on our family's channel. There's a couple stories that really kind of like I had this aha moment. And one of them was, again, this is, this is back in like 2008 or nine, maybe something, where I got this email from this lady in Texas, apparently. And she said like, hey, uh, I've been watching your videos for a while. I really love them. I will let you know. I got married two months ago. My husband and I were already struggling in our relationship. I don't know if it's going to last, um, but I watched one of your videos where you and your wife were just casually talking about how you're learning to love each other better. She said, I shared that video with my husband. We watched it together and then we talked about it. And now we have hope again for our marriage. And I just wanted to say thank you. And I was like, whoa, what just happened? <laughs> you know. But the stories didn't stop there. They kept going. There was like this... this uh, this um this this teenage girl in uh i forget what state we were in but she just came up to us recognized like hey i watch your videos you don't know me but i love them it's like i've noticed that since i started watching your videos that i've really raised my standard for the type of guys that i date and will one day marry and she's like i just wanted to say thank you i'm like really that happened because of our videos (laughs) so instead of working with like a few teenagers and families maybe you know I was talking maybe like a hundred or so a week I realized like on YouTube like I'm reaching millions a month you know and the stories that are coming out of that were very similar to the stories that I was like putting in like my sweat and tears to work with like maybe a couple family families individually uh, which I love doing there's something to be said for a real face-to-face relationship so anyway I, I just kind of naturally started ended up gravitating towards YouTube because I saw that I could scale the impact and the influence that you can have on really reaching people and changing their life with a message that really matters. It's really cool to me, you know, you guys had a willingness to put yourself out there and it was in your willingness to open up the good and the bad maybe, or, you know, I, mean, I, don't, I don't know if, if you, I've seen some of your, some of your stuff and I would say that you guys are really open. You do put up the good and I don't, I want to say that you put up the bad too, but, no, we, but it's uh, not, it's not uber, reason, cl- right? it's not like uber it's cleansed, internet. right? It's not like, you know, every shot is the perfect selfie or this or that. So, and, and so you guys started putting yourself out there and people gravitated towards it. Um, I guess the question I have is one, was it hard or did it come naturally to you? And two, is that like a key component of, 
of creating a really great YouTube community is to be willing to put yourself out there? One is it wasn't hard because at the time we were just doing it for our friends and family. You know, this is pre Facebook. There is no like status updates. There was no Twitter. There was nothing, you know. So we were speaking primarily to our family and sharing stuff that we would normally share with our family and not really realizing that YouTube was going to grow and other people were going to find it. <laughs> so, no, it's not really weird for us. I mean, that said, we, we don't, it is the internet. We don't put anything out there. There's some everything out there. There's not, there's just some things that the world doesn't need to know about, doesn't need to hear. Like it's private family matters, right? So, and then the second question was what? Is whether you, you feel that it's really a key component in, a, oh, in yeah. starting and establishing a YouTube community around you, you know, to be a YouTube creator. Is there this natural need that you have to put yourself out there? Uh, I would say no, because I, I mean, it certainly helps in a lot of different genres and niches on YouTube, different verticals. But like for vlogging, for example, yeah, I, I mean, you, people have to feel an attraction to feel like you're real. They can relate to you. They like you. They feel like they could hang out with you in real life, but they can't. So they watch your videos. You know, there has to be a relational component to it, but certainly not every type of content and every video strategy requires that. Um, you know, some people who only show their hands and never their faces, you know, I'm sure you've seen some of these toy channels that just are unboxing toys, you know, and, you know, so there's a lot of different, there's a room for a lot of different stuff on YouTube. Let's say that we have people who are more corporately or strategically minded and they're, and they're like, well, that's all great that you, you know, you do this and you put your family there, but you know, I need to get something out. I need to make something stick. How do you get from your hundred or 150 subscribers that it seems like every basic channel has to 1000 to 5,000 to 10,000? How do you get that first group? It's, um, very intentional. It's not, it usually doesn't happen by accident. There are some of those, but those are the, the, the exceptions, not the rule. So yeah, it takes a, a strategy to do that. So if that's your goal, subscribers are your goal, then you build a, a content strategy that will help you meet that. So, uh, and those other goals to have, whether it's like sales, that's a goal. Other times it's like, we just want exposure. Um, there's a lot of different types of goals people have. So if the goal is to build like an audience and a subscriber base, um, the very basic outline of, of like what every strategy would have to fall into these buckets is one, who is this for? Like who's the target audience? And then two, what's the value that we propose to deliver in business world? You need to call it value proposition. So who's the target audience? What's the value proposition? And then after you know those two things, you know who it's for and you know why they care, then you can start developing a content strategy around um to, to deliver that. And then there's other things, you know, as far as the structure of the video and call to actions and uh, there's other things that make it easier for people to, to subscribe. But either way, like the whole brand on YouTube of your videos, your header image, your channel trailer, like everything has to revolve around making it very clear to someone who's never heard of you before who this channel is for and why they should care. And in your experience and the people that, you know, in your community and the people that you're helping, are you finding they're going from zero to 5,000 in a matter of weeks or months? Or it's really like you need to be prepared to do six months, nine months, a year of, of content full heartedly, but knowing that very few people will see it at this time in order to get started? Or what are the expectations one should have if, if you're a bit more business focused? So you're not doing it for entertainment reasons, you're a bit more business focused and you want to build a following or community. It's hard to put in numbers to that because there's so many variables to consider. I would say, generally speaking, it's harder than people think it is to, to grow and to build, and uh, especially if it's your first channel. Now, video creators, I took that from zero to 10,000 subscribers in 12 months. So we, after year one, I had 10,000, and then after year two, I was at like 80,000. I don't know what I was at. I was at a lot more. <laughs> and now here we are about two and a half years later, and it's at 110,000. And that's in a relatively small niche, small industry compared to you know gaming and beauty and other vlogging, you know, a lot of other niches on YouTube. So there's just a lot of variables to consider, but overall, like I would say, you would you want to dedicate a good solid six months up to a year. Uh, it's just hard to it's just hard to measure. It's not going to happen overnight. So a little over a week ago, um, you know, you put out a video where you were speaking about the fact that you know you were focusing on target audience, and you noticed that there was this dip that YouTube creators go through where where they're excited, they're on board, they're they're ready to take on the world, and then they go, "Geez, this is like." 
this is really hard. Um, mm-hmm. do, do I really have it? Or maybe there's the, um, this, you know, like, oh, I'm never going to be as good as them, or am I really good enough? I'm, does anyone care? You know, I'm doing all this work and no one's seeing it. And, and you found that people have to power through. Is this something that people can power through, or is it really the people who are falling off didn't really have a good idea and maybe they shouldn't continue? Often it's like indicative of what people's expectations were going into it and also their motivation for doing it in the first place. So it's easy to look at some of these big YouTubers and they just make it look so effortless, right? And you're just like, wow, like if they can do that and this is the result they're getting, I can do this, no problem, you know? So people start by trying to be the next Shay Carl or the next PewDiePie or the next whatever. And then they realize, oh, this is a lot harder than I think it is. And so if their if their goal is like popularity and they just want to feel popular, they quickly discover, oh, there's another way to feel popular that doesn't require this much work. <laughs> you know, or if their goal is to like just try to make a quick buck and like, oh, I heard there's money on YouTube. I could start a channel and uh, you know, quit my day job, uh, which is totally possible, but people realize, oh, this is actually work. <laughs> this is actually hard. It takes time and dedication. And then you have the same the same thing. People give up pretty quickly and like, oh, there's probably other easier ways to make money. And they're right, there are. I think it really comes down to the motivation people have and is, is kind of if they get through that dip or not and how they push through it. You're in a position where you obviously push through the dip if it didn't happen for you. Um, you've you've poured yourself into this. I, I believe this is what you do full time, right? Like I, I don't. I've been full time for two and a half years. So you've been doing this full time for two and a half years. How do you day by day, week by week, month after month? I mean, I know there's the game and the analytics, and a lot of people in this area find find that a lot of fun. But but how do you not feel like, well, what am I really doing, and is it really good enough, and and how can I change, and will I, you know, do I risk losing my audience? And will I alienate them? And how can who's the comp- competition? And what's changed? Like, how do you keep the paranoia down? <laughs> I don't know. It's a good question. I guess I don't really. Maybe it comes back again to why you're doing it. Like my motivation, honestly, truly is to like spread messages that change lives. And after the experience we were having on our channel, so the backup fill in that story a little bit more. I was also contracted at realseo.com to produce weekly videos for them because they're like, hey Tim, you know a thing or two more about YouTube than the average person we know. Would you mind, you know, could we do a series? And I was like, all right, so. We did. We started doing that series, and um, and then that's kind of what gave me industry exposure. Real SEO sold to another company. I bowed out from the acquisition and uh, started Video Creators instead, because I wanted to help other people like have the same experience I was having on our family's channel. Like I'm only one guy. I only have like one, maybe two messages that are really worth sharing <laughs> to the world, but. There's so many other people out there who have experiences and, and wisdom and advice and insights that I could never have. And so I'm like, what if I could help those people spread their message so that it reaches and impacts more people? You know, those people will never look at me and say, oh, Tim, thank you so much for helping, you know, Mark get his YouTube channel to grow so that I could see his, you know, they're never going to know about me, but it doesn't, that's not the goal for me. It's not the point. Like, I don't care. The point for me is, can I help people improve the world in which we live and make this world a better place for everybody? And so kind of being an influencer of the influencers, so to speak, I feel like I, I can do that. And so that's my motivation. So for me, it's like, it's not really competition. It's like, hey, if you're on mission with me with this, then like, let's link arms. So I guess I don't really get bogged down personally in that stuff. I know other people who do, and your question is very valid. I, I, I just don't think that's me because of the motivation I have for why I do this. I love it. I love it because I, I, so I'm a Christian myself and I'm, I've been around enough Christian culture to, to hear exactly what you're saying, but you're putting it out <laughs> in such a non-Christian way. So that's... <laughs> well, I'm trying to explain it in ways that people understand, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's not about being Christian or non-Christian. No, no, no. I just, in the Christian culture, it's the idea of, you know, being on side and being on mission and standing for something and, and the greater good for others and helping and all of those great things that, that I hear, um, that I hear your yeah. background coming, coming, coming through. Um, well, people love that. Like people, like I don't know if it's like a Christian thing. It certainly is part of that culture, right? But um, I don't think it's exclusive to that because I think people are just attracted to people who know why they're doing what they're doing and not just what they're doing. You know, so most people, if you ask them why they work, it's because they want and they need money, and maybe their goal is just to make more money. And Personally, I think money is a terrible goal. Like, I think it makes a great tool, but it's a terrible goal, right? So, um, so when you start talking about this is why I do what I do, this is why it matters, 
Um, this is why you should care. People are like, I think they're just attracted to people like that from a leadership perspective because they're most people don't think about why they do and why it matters. And so that's going back to what I said about growing your YouTube channel. That's one of the best things you can do to grow a channel is to know why you're doing it, why it matters, and to communicate that value proposition to your audience, to your target audience, so that's very easy for them to not only know if it's for them or not, but also to know why they should care. And that why is, I think the why is really important. So, All right, I'm going to change gears a little bit. But yeah, I, I have could talk a about more, that for a while, sorry. <laughs> I have a more specific question for you. I want to know the top things that you think make a channel successful. It's so hard because like, I can think of exceptions immediately to all of these rules. But personally, just as far as best practices are concerned, probably one, uh, knowing who your video is for. And that's a really big mistake a lot of people make. They just think that their content will perform based on nothing more than the merit of the content. You know, they're like, this is just an amazing video that everyone will like. Well, okay, post it, see what happens. You know, I spelling with you like 90% of the time is not gonna go anywhere. So you need to know like who the, you're, you're specifically targeting, who's gonna like this. It has to be valuable for other people. I think a lot of, number two, like a lot of people, and this is kind of reiterating what I've said, but I think a lot, there's a lot of creators who just start a gaming channel or they just start vlogging because some for some reason the world should care about what they ate for lunch that day. A lot of people think about like, hey, I'm awesome. You should think so too. And, and no one actually says it that way, but that's kind of for all intents and purposes what's happening. And then they quickly realize, oh, no one else thinks I'm awesome. And so like you have to, people watch videos not because they just feel like, oh, Mark needs one more extra view count on his videos. Like I just have to give that to him. No, they watch it because is this video valuable for me or not? You know, do, is this something I care about? And so people watch for very selfish reasons. And that's fine. You know, we all consume content. People listening to this podcast right now are listening because they're hoping to get something of value out of it for themselves. So having a strategy that revolves around both of those things together is really important. Three, I think if you wanna build community, this is really important actually, this might get bumped off of number one, <laughs> is that, so the strongest communities, both online and offline, they don't revolve around common interests, they revolve around shared beliefs. And so if you meet someone has like something, you have something in common with them, you're like, okay, that's cool. Like you have something to talk about for a little bit and then you leave and you, you probably just kind of forget about the conversation. But if you meet someone who not only has that common interest, but they believe what you believe about it, and there's like that's wrapped up in it, then all of a sudden like that connection is so much stronger. Now you almost don't even care about like, in the sense of YouTube, like what the channel is about as much as you just believe what they believe and you want to be a part of that that community because you're on board with the mission. So I keep going back to that, I guess. I don't know why. But <laughs> so that so um, in Patrick Hanlon's book called Primal Branding, he outlines like the seven aspects of what he calls the primal code of what what do the brands that have like a cult following around them, um, why do they have cult followings versus other brands that don't? And so he pulls out, and one of them one of them is really big, he calls it the creed. And the creed is simply, what do you believe and why do you believe it? And making that a part of your, your channel in YouTube's case, if you're Apple, it's like, you know, to think different. And um, like we believe something about creative people that's different, you know, that, so it's, it revolves around beliefs. Those are the first three that come to mind. Very cool. And on the flip side of that, you know, the easy answer to common mistakes people make is the opposite of everything you just said. But are, are there some mistakes where it just leaves you shaking your head or you're like, oh, gosh, like, watch this video. I explain it so easily for you. <laughs> now, uh, some of the other common mistakes would probably be more like super practical ones, like beyond what we've talked about, because what we've been talking about is pretty philosophical, you know. Um, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, it's more about like their titles and thumbnails. Like they might have an awesome piece of content, but the title and the thumbnail aren't enticing and don't pitch value and, you know, don't accurately portray the content, then no one's going to click it in the first place, you know? So, um, and vice versa, you could have a, a really lame piece of content, but an amazing thumbnail and title and people will click and watch it. No, they won't stick around if it's lame. You need both, right? You need amazing content, but you also need to pitch it really well. And so that title and thumbnail are really important. And a lot of people, when they title their videos and create their thumbnails, they're just pitching the what. And again, to come back to the why, that's more important. So when I make a video, for example, talk about something like how to enable two-step verification on your YouTube channel. My subscribers are like, I don't even, what is two-step verification? I don't know why I should care about this video. And they skip it. Conversely, if I, if I title it, 
how to prevent your YouTube channel from getting hacked, now everyone knows exactly why that video matters and they watch it. So the point isn't necessarily teaching about two-step verification. It's more about why the video is valuable and matters in the first place. And so when you title your videos, like it's really important to do it like that. Um, unless you're, you know, going after search queries about two-step verification, uh, I'm going more after like my subscriber base and my audience, and and uh, teaching them about they don't know why they should care about that yet until they watch the video, then they care. So, and then having thumbnails that either that relate to the title very well, either tease the story or show like a close-up of the action. You know, being close-up is really important because on mobile devices, which over half of YouTube's users are on mobile now. Um, like those tiny little screens, you need to have a thumbnail that has high contrast and uh, is very clearly discernible on mobile. And then the third thing, the next biggest mistake is probably people start their video from like, uh, and this is a, a typical industry mistake. Um, natural YouTubers don't make it as much, but they start making content the way they're going to make it for TV, you know, and that's they, they take a long time to kind of set the scene, you know, to come in, to set the mood, to establish the characters and all that. And that makes sense for TV, like for movies or TV. But on YouTube, everyone is so trigger happy to like click away to the next video that you really, in the, in the first 15 seconds of the video, have to affirm for the viewer somehow that what you clicked on, the value you clicked expecting to get will actually be delivered in this video. If they click the title and thumbnail expecting one thing and then 30 seconds into the video, there has been no confirmation that that's going to be a part of this video or it's taking too long to get there or something, people will click away. So you definitely need to make the first 15 seconds tie into the title and thumbnail. And so I usually recommend people start before they even shoot the video they know what the title and the thumbnail is going to look like, and then they shoot the video, the first 15 seconds specifically, with that title and that thumbnail in mind so they can make the, all three of those things kind of work and complement each other. Does that help? <laughs> that, that, is, that is awesome. How does one get over the, the uncomfortable feeling that I think people should feel about making a channel all about themselves? If you make the channel about yourself, no one's going to care or watch it, but... Um, even in blogging though, it has to be around the, around other people where it looks like the channel's all about them, but there's two values going on. Um, usually, um, at least one, sometimes preferably two, if you do it well, that, uh, that are going on. One is like I kind of alluded to, that's the relational value. And that is, I feel like I'm hanging out with my friend right now. Like, I feel like I know you, I feel like we believe something similar about these, some, about something, um, and so there's a perceived relationship and that is valuable to people. And that, so that's could be one reason why they watch. So again, it's not really because they really care about you, although they feel like they do, but they actually care about the feeling you give them <laughs> about themselves. Because one of the things about happens in parasocial relationships is that the audience feels like they get to know this person, but it's actually like a really idealized version of that person because that person is moderating what the audience gets to know about them, right? Just like anyone does on Facebook. You don't post everything there, hopefully. You post what you, you craft an image of yourself that you want people to see online. And so you post things that, you know, that uh, help you accomplish whatever image of yourself you're trying to portray. So when you make a channel all about yourself, no one cares about that unless you are giving them a feeling about themselves. And they look at you and say, hey, like Mark seems like he is like the perfect dad. Uh, I want to be like that, you know, or uh, I feel like I could have total and complete acceptance by this person, even though like at school, no one pays attention to me. I'm like, no one sits at lunch with me. But when I hang out with Shay Carl, even though there's literally millions of other people watching, I feel like he's talking to me and I feel valued. I feel special. So even then it, it comes back to the value of, of selfishly that the person is, is getting. So that's the one value. The race relational value is super strong, super powerful. If you nail that, you can move mountains. You can like change the world. You can mobilize your audience to do almost anything for you and to make a really big difference in the world actually in a lot of different ways, which are some cool stories about that. The second value though is that um, since the relational value takes time to develop, just like in real life, you know, relationships take time. And on YouTube, because people are so quick and easy to click away to other videos, um, it's really hard to establish that relational value unless you just have like a super inviting, outgoing, 
personality, which I don't have. So the other way to do it is you have what I call a hook value. And that's what we do on our family's channel is it's actually not about us as much as it's about let's uh, let's share with you guys what we're currently exploring about how we are living our life as a family, um, our, our marriage, how we're parenting. And let's make videos for our, our target audience are young moms. And we're making videos. The value proposition is become a family team. And so that's something our family is exploring together is how are we not just a group of you know individuals cohabiting the same space, but how can we work together as a team to uh, accomplish our family's vision and our family's goals together. And so that's usually something kind of new and intriguing to people. And so they watch because they want to know how how might that look, what does that look like, one. And then two, is that something I can do in my own family? And, uh, and so, again, that's the value that they're trying to get for themselves is how are Tim and Dana doing it? And, uh, and then we're also building the relational value through that. I know that you're deep, deep, deep into YouTube. So these might be things that you can't even believe people think. But, you know, if we go back a few years, we knew that view count mattered. And then view count didn't matter as much as retention. And then retention doesn't matter as much as other things. And it's constantly changing. Can we just set a very, for you know, for, for fairly basic people, a very baseline area in terms of what metrics um, you know, are just maybe more important, more relevant to hit, so they're not, you know, super spamming SEO when the name of the video doesn't really matter anymore, or just things like that. If I'm a producer, if I'm a company, if I'm a marketer, what should I be focusing on? Should I be focusing on strategic keywords within my titles? Should I be focusing on certain lengths because shorter yeah, is better, okay. even though the average video is longer? The biggest overall thing is uh, that you need, everyone needs to focus on, and I'm sure there's going to be no disagreement here, is how do I serve people well, like with this content? How do I deliver value to them to the best of my ability? So that always comes first. And content that is really valuable and serves people well, typically will outperform people who have perfect, quote, you know, SEO. They have, they've done all their keyword research. They have all their titles perfectly crafted. They have thumbnails that are like just mind-blowingly amazing. I don't know how you do that, but <laughs> <laughs> you have one. But if the content is really valuable for people and people start sharing it, that trumps, you know, if if a trusted friend tells you to watch a video, you don't really care if the title and thumbnail are at that point. So there's two big signals that Google looks at to determine is this video valuable to people. And the first one, and this is bigger than titles, this is bigger than metadata, this is bigger than, you know, all the other tricks people try to do. The first one is uh, watch time. And that is simply like, how much time is are people spending watching this video? Uh, are they 10 seconds after starting, the, like they start watching it, do they abandon it? Or are they watching like a good five minutes? Or are they 10 minutes, you know, or whatever the length of the video is. But like how, how much time do people spend watching it? And that's a really big positive signal to Google if it's, you know, accumulating a lot of watch time. And the second biggest signal, as far as we know anyway, is session watch time, which is how does this video contribute to a viewer's overall viewing session on YouTube? So does it end their session? Like maybe it ends with a call to action to send everyone to a website and it's really successful at that. But like, well, that ends everyone's viewing session. Well, YouTube wants people to stay on YouTube longer and to watch more videos and to see more ads, right? Subscribe to more channels, engage with more content. So uh, if a video ends our viewing session, they're not going to rank that and promote that nearly as high as a video that maybe says like after Google learns like, hey, if someone watches this video, they go ahead and they watch these five other videos or these two videos or these 10 videos. And so they start learning kind of what the viewing session is based on which videos they promote. And uh, so those two watch time features play in pretty heavily into uh, metrics that you should be watching. The other thing to watch is probably um, audience retention, which a lot of people think about uh, watch time in terms of percentage of the video that's watched, but uh, that's not how it is. It's actually total accumulated time spent watching the video. However, they do track percentages and those are for you as a creator. So you can see when are people abandoning my video? When are they dropping off? Uh, when are they uh, like rewinding and watching this part again, either because it was funny or because it was confusing or because it was shocking, you know, something. And it's really starting to learning uh, how do you optimize your actual content for people. I have a friend of mine who 
um, noticed from his audience retention scores on YouTube uh, and the graphs there that and whenever he would say the word module, people would abandon his video. <laughs> and so he's like, well, like that's weird. He stopped using the word module and he instantly started getting more watch time because he had higher audience retention. Why? Well, I think the why um, for him was that module is like a word that triggers like boring school academics uh. Uh, type of thing. And um, that wasn't really the feeling he was trying to go after. And so when he stopped using the word module, people stuck around longer. So if he just changed it to of that. maybe like session or. Yeah, that's or what he said. I don't remember the exact where he switched okay. it to, but he just switched it to a different word in it. And he, he started getting more watch time again. That's so, amazing. That's amazing that people have the ability to, in, in almost real time, to to be able to track these things, notice these things, and then make changes to get better. Yep, exactly. So those those tools, those metrics, those are ones that I would definitely be watching for that are really important. For me, I don't know much about YouTube, so this is very informative and I learned a lot. So thank you for that. Good. You mentioned something about retention and people watching and and kind of losing focus really quick and, and jumping around. How do you then ensure that you don't become just a flavor of the week and then jump on, they jump to something else? Do you just continue your mission, what you believe in, or do you have to like be kind of shifting and, and be becoming like chameleon, trying to grab things from here to there, <laughs> different trends and what have you? It depends on why people subscribe to you in the first place. So if they subscribe to you because you're funny, and all your jokes are now kind of used and burned through and stale, then the value isn't there for people anymore. So yeah, they're going to click away to somewhere else. If they subscribe to you to learn how to grow their video production company and you're no longer delivering on that value, yeah, they'll, they'll click away. Really, as long as you're delivering the value that people subscribe to get and that they're expecting, you will, you will keep them. Now that said, I do think that there's something to be said for creators who need to reinvent themselves after some time, either one from a creative perspective, like they're just bored with, the, with what they're doing, but also maybe the audience is getting kind of bored with the style also. And, uh, and so I think there's something to be said for delivering the same value, but finding other ways to deliver it in ways that are like fresh and meaningful and new and kind of keep people engaged. So sometimes that just means like, changing up the editing style. Sometimes that means changing the content strategy. Sometimes that means a lot of different things, but uh, that's really what it comes down to though. So in the video that you, um, that I mentioned earlier that you put out a little over a week ago where you talked about the, the target audiences and the dip and you know, you, there's this great whiteboard video that you took it through. And to answer your question, you asked, hey, how do you like the whiteboard? As a viewer, I like the whiteboard. Okay. I think it's nice and I think it's very analog and I like something you can... It's not. I brought the old school into the new school. Exactly. You, sh you know what you should do, actually? Move to um, an overhead projector. I think we need to bring uh, those yeah. back. I think well, no, seriously, I do know I need to put a, a tighter angle on the, on the board. <laughs> but Well, but you, so the part of it, I found the whole video very interesting, And but the part that I thought was and you went you went over it so fast, so I don't know if it was something that, that you said in passing, but you said, I'm not sure if I need to change my channel, if I need to direct more to the people before the dip or after the dip, and I'm a bit afraid... You know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit afraid to change too much, and it's mm -hmm. interesting to me because as, as a business owner who tends to overthink everything, and and part of this podcast is always us trying to push through our fears and 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 grow and get better. And so it was insightful to me to watch you, someone who is who is an expert who does put themselves out there, who does all those things, very quickly admit that you know you're a bit, a little bit fearful about about making a big change that might alienate people. And so I'm curious if that. If that's something that has has been sitting with you, or if you said in passing, or if you're if you're no, genuinely genuinely a bit afraid to make this big change, and then how do you work through that? Yeah, no, I've definitely been thinking about that because, um, like, let's just be totally honest here. My channel's pretty much plateaued. Um, now, by plateau, I mean it's still growing, but the growth rate has been the same for like I don't know most of the, this year, and that is, it's like I don't even know. 200 some subscribers a day which um, might sound a lot to some people but so it might either be like I've actually maxed my full potential and the potential of this channel I kind of don't think so um, even if I have like I'm not content to say that like, I want to figure out a way to that not be true and figure out how to keep pushing it and so the question I was like okay so maybe what I'm doing right now like I've I've kind of maxed the amount of growth I can get from what I'm doing the way I'm doing it right now. And so for me, it's kind of like think about like how do I start changing things it's kind of scary because I figured out for my audience like exactly how to keep very predictably get around 250 to 300 subscribers a day. 
And if I just keep doing that all day long, or uh, I mean like for years, you know, it'll grow into a sizable channel. But I guess I'm not content to just say like, hey, I figured out how to get 250 to 300 a day. There, I know there's room to grow to be closer to like a, a thousand a day, right? And uh, so I want to figure out what to do. But the, but the scary part is if I change something, I might actually take a step backwards. You know, like I might, what if I drop to like 50 subscribers a day? You know, what if I stop getting subscribers? Or what if my, like I, I, I think, okay, let's try this. My audience becomes even more disengaged than they already are. You know, and then, and then I'm starting to risk like my credibility, trust, um, respect, you know, things like that, and which are the actual, you know, pieces of currency we actually make our living off of for most of us. But I also know that if I don't change, eventually things will continue to dwindle and die. So I kind of have to, and I'd rather do it while I have momentum than keep doing the same old, same old, and then wonder, you know why it's not working anymore. I find so. this I find this so interesting and thank you for sharing that only cuz where you're at is the root of almost all successful people. It's the you got gumption, you got something, you get lucky, you work hard, you build something and then we get to a point where we're like, "Oh, we don't want to risk what we have." And then, you know, whether you lose it all anyway. <laughs> I, I talked to my wife about it. It's like the fistful of sand, right? Like the harder you try to hold on to all the sand, the more it slips out of your fingers. Anybody growing any business, once you get successful, you get scared. You get scared to, you know, and and all the risks that you took and all the things that you know, you didn't quite care about and, you know, you're a small channel, so let's take a risk, let's try it out. All of that stuff becomes a little bit harder. So, I would love to hear how you get through this cuz this is the thing that, you know, I've been, I've been running my business for nine years and um, it's a thing we're constantly battling. It's, it's how do you get better? How do you push? How do you grow? How do you do the things that you want to do and move into the area you want to without potentially risking all the stuff that's keeping food on the table? Yeah. The other thing is that I don't really want to position myself just as an expert. I want to position myself as like a human being <laughs> who's like more of like, hey, I'm, in, I'm doing this with you guys. Like, yes, I, you're a creator. I'm a creator. I'm a little bit ahead of you. Like I've done a few channels before and I've worked with a lot of America's top brands. And, you know, I've done a lot of, you know, what other people consider successful things in the YouTube world. But that doesn't mean I'm still not learning. You know, I'm still not growing. And I feel like if I talk about my journey um, pretty openly. I my hope is that it helps encourage and inspire other people. Like, oh, okay, if Tim has the freedom to fail, then I should have the freedom to fail. You know, if Tim has the freedom to experiment, he's giving himself. You know, you know, so it might actually work out really terribly for my channel in the long run, and I might be without income <laughs> eventually. I don't know, but to me, again, like the money isn't the goal; it's just a tool to something bigger. And there's other ways to make money, so I'm not really concerned about it. I just, I just uh, want to give other people. It's like it's about serving people well, and I think that sharing my story kind of vulnerably can serve people better than if I tried to pretend like I had it all together all the time. Because really, honestly, like who really does? Nobody. And if someone does, like you know they're lying. So. <laughs> So that was our conversation with Tim Schmoyer. We're going to move into catch-up time, but just real quick, if you Mustard. wanted to connect with uh, Tim uh, directly, you can find him on Twitter, at Tim Schmoyer. Uh, his last name is spelled S-C-H-M-O-Y-E-R. Or on Instagram, Tim Schmoyer. Or YouTube, you can find him under the username videocreators.tv. Okay, so for catch-up time, Leah, what are we doing this time? I brought okay. some interesting tidbits about the world that I thought we could get your <laughs> opinions on, guys. Roland's not opinionated at all. Yeah. Okay. The first one, and the one I think Roland's going to have the most to say about, is they re released the Harry Potter books interactively on iPads and iPhones and et cetera. Et cetera. Sorry, that's a story? So, so, yeah. so the publisher or something of, of Harry Potter, what? They, they made an iPad okay, app? The, I, I'm the confused. No, the digital version. So, they interacted. You're so allowed Apple's, to touch the kids. You will, now, <laughs> you will now be able to get them on iBooks, which you weren't able to before you could only download them from pottermore which is a website <laughs> rolling launched um as a portal to the wizarding wizarding world like how much do you know about harry potter None so thing. now you can get them on ibooks but they're like interactive books they're like uh you can like click Touch and find kids. different pictures uh, Roland, have you read the harry potter books no i don't know anything have you it. watched the movies some of them which ones i have no idea 
<laughs> you've, Any, you've read the books, right, Leah? I've read them all, and I've seen all the movies. What's the difference between the interactive and, books and the real books? Okay, so the real books are books. I don't know if you're familiar with them. <laughs> They're like the books over Please there. Please explain to me. Um, okay, so Roland, the, a book was actually... <laughs> uh, when, when, did, when did books really become big? In the, the 15th printing, century? When the printing pass came out. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So Gutenberg, it's a bound right? paper, oh, and oh. All, the whole story's in there. Oh. These interactive books have things that the kids can not just kids because adults read these oh. too they can click on and they can mm. get more information okay, or when pictures you say et cetera, adult et versions are there adult because that sounds wrong no say ad, an adult no version? i said i didn't say adult version i said adults read them too so they're not just kids books right yeah so absolutely. people can interact <laughs> with them my question i would, to I you would guys actually was argue like, i would actually argue that the first three books are kids books and then books four through seven were adult books because after Goblet of Fire, it got a lot bigger yeah. and, and there was death, right? Yeah, when Cedric you know? Diggory dies, you're Boom, like, I Goblet can't, of Fire. I can't, I can't move on with it from Although, this. I guess in the very first book, in the very first premise, his parents were killed. They were murdered by yeah, an evil dude. Okay. So I'm guessing that there, there was already death in the cards, but yeah. Yeah, but a lot of children's stories have deaths of parents that are like, that happened uh, as a precursor to the story. That's Off okay. Screen. But like, yeah, like when, like, when like a child my dies. My kids happened to like Frozen, right? Yeah. And, and my son, died. Every have you guys seen Frozen? Your kids are too young. Your kids are too young. Have, have you guys seen Frozen? What is yes, Frozen? Yes, I've seen Frozen. What is Frozen? <laughs> Come on, dude. Yeah. Actually, what is I don't know. Don't don't talk about the song. I don't want to know about the song. I don't want to. But but in in the opening sequence, right? They get about on a what ship. Song? <laughs> what song? No, don't make me say it. Okay, we no. We <laughs> go. I don't even know what Frozen is. It's stuck in everyone's head. I don't want to hear it. What song? So when they get on the ship, the ship like subtly sinks, and and it's funny though because they do it really subtly, so only the older kids would know that the it's in a had storm. Died. Right, but but the younger kids don't know what's going on. So my son, who was six at the time, would loudly announce every time he watched, he'd be like, "They're dead. <laughs> the parents are dead." <laughs> and and it's like I'm like I'm like shh, shh, shh. I'm like like their other kids are. And he'd be like, "Daddy, they died. <laughs> Her parents are dead." <laughs> that was funny. I'm like, oh, Captain okay, Crazy. Yeah. I guess Captain it's in crazy. a it's in a musical montage at the beginning. It, it so. is. It's in it's in the knocking on the door. Do you want to build a snowman? Mm-hmm. Which my son also happens to know. And so if he sings the whole song, he'll be like. This is the part where the parents die. So, wow. Yeah. Wow. <clears throat> Little boys. It's definitely boys. your son, eh? My question to you guys about the books, yeah. which if, if we can get back to that, was like sure. literacy. <laughs> like, do we have to you make... You sound like Warren now trying to get back on topic with us. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me walk to the third... Mm, I'm trying to make fun of him. Don't yeah, make fun of Warren. He's a good that. guy. He's a great guy. He was an awesome podcast guest. Self-proclaimed. A great <laughs> guest. <laughs> a really smart guy. So, he, yeah, he claimed. Um... So, so now sorry, your question is literacy rates amongst children. Should it be interactive or not? No, just like, are we having to make books more like video and TV and stuff to get kids to read them? Because no. they're like super imaginative, awesome books. Like they're not boring books. Okay, so here's, here's the problem. If you want to hand your kid a device to keep them quiet and, I, and so I that way you, you don't have to make them do it, then yes, give them an interactive book. But if you sit with them to read, or right. if you read to them, or you or they're older and they read, and you make them read, and you say, go have quiet time, and you have to force them to do that, and you have to make sure they're reading, then yes, reading is better. So it's it's just, it's just I guess, you know, I don't, I don't want to call people who Lazy for- parenting versus... No, I did not say that. I did not say that. But <laughs> that's but pretty much what you're that's saying. That's where we were going with that. No, yeah. my, like, it's, it's my like, child has seen that Olaf song video a lot of times, and he's 13 months, so... Olaf it, when he, when he when he dances and he jumps over song, the puddle. Yeah. That's like an yeah. instant quiet and very excited and watches right. the whole thing. Look, that's why you do it. That's why you yeah. need to write right. books. But, but if you and your son were to sing it and act it out in character, better. it would be a lot more effort. Yeah. So and, but it's, better. It's, right? Do you have the time for it or not? This yeah. is this is stupid. This is a stupid question. Are you willing to put all the time into this? <laughs> Good. Next question. <laughs> <laughs> Are we gonna, we're going to end each topic. I thought with, we'd also talk about We're going to end each topic with a, this is a stupid question. Yeah. Have well, you guys watched all the movies recently? The, the Harry Potter We ones? just finished number 7B. I guess there's 7A and 7B. Yeah. Um, I think like six months ago we watched it. We've, yeah. we've had kids for a long time, so pre-kids we were oh, able to see Oh, did they everyone. watch them? No, gosh Not no. yet. Oh, that would terrify Could my Could see the first one? No. no. Oh, no. No, not yet? No, 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 no. How old do they have to be? My nephew's, you know, comfortable watching scarier movies from a younger age because of his personality type and what he's used to. My daughter... You're saying it depends on the personality and sensibility? Yeah. Yeah. Mm, my sense. daughter's really sensitive, so my son, it wouldn't scare him. But, like, my kids watch Scooby-Doo, the old Scooby-Doos. Yeah. So awesome. Yeah. And my oldest daughter will be afraid, my four-year-old son, maybe he just doesn't understand what's going on. I don't know, but he's just like, he's just like, I'm not scared. 
I'm not scared. I don't care. And my wife will be like, you kids are not allowed to watch Scooby-Doo. And my uh, daughter will freak out. She'll have nightmares about it. So it just depends on the kid. About a doggy? Scooby-Doo, it's usually they go into like a haunted mansion. Yeah, yeah, it's usually the property. That. It's usually the yeah, property. Yeah, the haunted dude, property. But yeah, the, the maintenance man is dressed up as a ghost. No, no. Always, right? So good. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, okay, I see what <laughs> oh, you're saying. No. Me and John's like goal in life is to go to Harry Potter land. And he said in we have Orlando? to wait. Orlando? Yeah, he said we have to wait <laughs> until... Your, hold Ro- on, hold on. So your husband, hold on, your husband has an MBA and a racehorse, and Life you goals. guys are really... Mark, f- you guys, that's what we're going to say, no more MBA. We weren't, but here's that's the thing. It. This guy owns a racehorse, and he has an MBA, and he has a good job, and he drives a BMW, and you guys live he in does. a big house, and his dream is bucket list North is to go to Orlando. Orlando. <laughs> <laughs> Not to go to Orlando, to go to Harry Potter World. We're huge Harry Potter fans. We have wa- robes, Woo. we have wands. Why is your wife a squeaky? Because she's passionate. Uh, I'm really excited about Harry <laughs> you Potter. You know, Dan's been to Harry Potter World in Orlando twice, I think. I know. So, our, John says he go can't go until our kids can go. So, I'm potentially waiting nine years for this. Anyway, I'm not going to get Are we really going to listen to this? <laughs> this is what we're doing, Roland. We're having topics. Okay, if you don't like you, that topic, You don't okay. like the topic, you bring the topic next time, yeah, buddy. next topic. Sure next okay, time? so as I'm sure everyone knows, I want to get your uh, weigh-ins on this topic of Facebook coming out with the new reaction button, so it's not just going to be like anymore for Roland, who probably doesn't know this because he never goes on Facebook. Roland it's goes on Facebook <laughs> all the time. He doesn't post anything on Facebook. Ever. He stalks Ever. everybody. I'm a stalker. But it, so that you can also love something, haha, ha, wow. But it says that it's going to roll out slowly starting in some like European countries, right? Yeah. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, in Spain and somewhere but, else. But it'll be here uh, eventually, right? And things like... Why Facebook. Europe uh, first? Because they're more uh, more open to ideas? Well, or, or less mean? I think, I think they're do, I think struggling do, harder with just having to like. No, I think it has they, to do with gun control. <laughs> <laughs> they have a more in the hero. It has to do with gun control. You guys probably don't Facebook as much as I do. I think I'm more of a H- Facebook here's, demographic. Here's what I think. I think that the line that Facebook has, has talked about for the last number of years is the truth. If you like something, you like it. And if it's something that isn't warn- warranted of being liked, you leave a personal comment. Right? You don't like that someone's parent accidentally died or suddenly died. Okay. You leave a comment. Yes. And you don't like that your child broke their arm you leave a comment. And so I don't need like love, yay, wow, sad. Leave a bloody comment already. Like like interact with me like I'm a real person and not just Why like just two clicks. just pick up the phone and call the person. Well, I don't, you know, who, do you have everybody's phone numbers these days? <laughs> do you guys communicate through emojis ever? Uh, yeah, sometimes I'll be like, I'll be like dancing lady, dancing lady, smiley face, <laughs> wink. <laughs> to your wife? Oh, you, I thought to, you meant to Roland. To Roland. <laughs> What's Dancing Lady? <laughs> oh, you know what Dancing Lady is. <laughs> no, she has a red dress and she's foxy. Oh, yeah. No, she's actually, sassy. hold on. So she's let's let everybody lady. everybody pull up your phones right now and look at the most reason, recent. Oh, Roland, come on. I'm like, where pull it up is. the most recent I don't have emojis. An iPhone. What? When have I used oh, these? Okay, mine. Okay, what's what's your most frequently used? Wine glass. <laughs> <laughs> Wine glass. Okay, mine is smiley face with hearts in it. And then oh, my second nice. one is winky face with tongue sticking out. Oh, shit. What's your second one? <laughs> What's your second one after All wine glass? All four of my second <laughs> ones were crying person, really crying person, crying cat, and another crying person. <laughs> <laughs> so hold on. So your top so your top emojis on your frequently <laughs> used... Oh, wine glass and crying people. <laughs> so that pretty much explains what you do in that the evening. That kind of explains your personality. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> evenings and weekends are filled with, what, crying people, crying babies, and a and lot so, of alcohol. And some wine in the middle. Oh, man. That is hilarious. So mine is <laughs> smiley face with hearts for my wife. Winky face with stung ticking out for my wife. Oh, the, my third one is the winking with a kiss with Ooh. the heart. And for some reason, my fourth one is a hamster. <laughs> I don't is know that why. for Oscar? It's a hamster followed by spaghetti, woman <laughs> with a hand up, wine glass, dinner fork, broken heart, rabbit, pig. <laughs> I think, oh, you know what it is? I, I like to put these strings together of the craziest emojis I can for my wife Uh-oh. that make no sense. So other than the few smiley faces that I give, all the rest of them... <laughs> are you being funny? <laughs> are me trying to be like, you know, dancing lady, wo- woman with hands up, baby bottle, poodle, frog, boar, woman <laughs> with her arms crossed. <laughs> that's that's like a string. That's a good string. That is a really good string. Yeah. Well, well that was fun. Good yeah. work. All right. Next topic. Want another topic? Listen, uh, hey, that you know what? We're going to do this new thing, pass or fail. So f- Harry Potter, not a good topic. Yeah. Well, like or dislike. Like or dislike? I liked it because mostly because of Leah's it. alcoholism <laughs> and, and, you know, the broken home that she's creating. 
Okay, so so okay, so that one passed. So our th- our third one. Okay, so NASA said that um, that a probe found blue skies and frozen water on the surface of the dwarf planet Pluto. So is pl- is Pluto a plan? Is it's a dwarf planet? It's a planet? It's not a planet? What is it? It's a rock. What is it, Roland? They are considering. I think they're trying to make it, it as a planet. Yes. I saw a really good. Did Facebook? you get pissed off when they like? I think it was like 2006 or 2005 yeah. or something, maybe earlier when they delisted it. Yeah. That kind of pissed you off. I got so mad because no, I, I was like, I don't. I care. tried so hard to remember the nine planets when I was a kid. Oh, I don't even know them in order. <laughs> there was eight. Okay, so what are they? <laughs> what are time. they in order? Go. That's what I said when I was a kid. So you start with the sun, and then <laughs> the sun what? is not a the planet. The sun's not a planet. I don't. I didn't got even Neptune, learn this. The, the guy was a mm-hmm. Neptune, Venus, Earth, Mars. Yeah. Then Jupiter, Saturn, mm-hmm. uh, Uranus, Uranus, and Pluto. Okay, so I know most of those because they're either chocolate bars or car <laughs> companies. But I don't. I'm not great with the planets because I thought the sun was a planet. Doesn't everything revolve around the sun? <laughs> exactly. How planets you, revolve around the sun. How did you sun. think the sun was a planet? What about the moon? Is the moon a planet? No, it's no. just a moon. It's a moon. Like the moon of Endor. <laughs> so, so you know, last week here you're like, how come you worked so hard to make your employees look stupid? Um, I don't know anything about space other than what John oh, Luke Picard taught me. I love space. Space is, <laughs> space is so awesome. <laughs> you love space. No, you, you don't. just said that like, like, like oh, she some, likes wine. Oh, man. I'm going to send you some emojis. Wine glass, <laughs> moon, wine glass. Crying space. baby. <laughs> well, Cry no, actually, baby. it's not true because I learned a lot from Apollo 13, Ron Howard's greatest film, that next to Far and Away. Yeah. Far and Away is actually his best oh, film. Did you see? They into the mic more pictures about oh um, yeah the um the landing the lunar about, landings yeah 1300 that? photos or something okay 13, but 000? i like i want to know like what that was, was like the 10, straw what was the straw that broke the camel's back they were like fine we'll give you more pictures finally like people have been talking about that for years i think technology uploading abilities um they had to have them all digitized but and like, they were like just sick and tired of what i don't know sick don't and tired know. of it's people. just like everything in america took forever Dude, the think. resolution is pretty crazy on some of those photos. I don't I don't know what kind of camera they were taking it on, but but there are like stunning some of them are stunning photos. Maybe it took them this long to like Process. stage it. Was CGI. It. No, to stage it and it was CGI. take these pictures. Really? Stanley Kubrick is actually still alive. Should we bring Chris Shooting. back on from episode one oh, to talk about shit. to talk about why the moon landing was fake? He's yeah, kind of, yeah, we it. should be like we have some questions. Can now. we yeah. Skype him in? Yeah, Can we I Skype him in? Yeah. Before. Let's hold on, let's Skype him in right now. What's this phone number? Two eight nine. I don't know the rest. Oh my goodness, Roland! If you had his phone number memorized, I'd <laughs> be like, funny. "How many emojis do you send him?" <laughs> Hold on, right, just everyone be ready so we can talk to him. I'm ready. Yeah, I'm, I'm ready. unable to get to the phone right oh, now. Okay. Oh. We'll leave him a message. Hold on. And a message, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you. Hey, Chris, it's Mark calling from the Not So Corporate Podcast. I hope you're doing well. We actually have you live right now on the air because we wanted to talk to you about the moon landing. Yeah, we got some new information. There are some pictures released, and we were chatting about it. We feel like you're an authority on the subject, so like, yeah. So we so wanted to talk to you, buds. We wanted to talk to you, but unfortunately, all the audience is going to hear now is your voicemail. So anyway, hope you're well. Take care. Bye. Bye. <laughs> okay, carrying on. So Chris can't help us with discovering whether the moon landing was fake or not, but something has to do with radiation. He's always like some kind of belt, the something belt, and radiation, and I don't know. I don't know. Anyway. I like how he was our phone a friend. <laughs> We're like, don't worry, we know a guy about this. Okay, that was awesome. Yeah. So, so well, hold on. So the um, Pluto pass or fail? We didn't actually talk anything about it, but I say that topic uh, passes. Yes. Okay, and so with this week's question of the week to our audience, Leah, we would like to know what your favorite YouTube channel is. Perfect. So hit us up with your favorite YouTube channel. You can uh, tweet us at Phantom Media. You can email us. Uh, it's feedback at notsocorporatepodcast.com. Or you can leave a comment on the bottom of our blog episode page. We would love to hear your feedback. We'd love to get your answer to this question. And we will potentially read the questions on future podcasts. Uh, listen, thanks so much for joining me, guys. It was a pleasure. It was, it was, it was, a, great. It was a great week. It was a good week. I really it was enjoyed. a good week. Tim was great. Tim was great. Tim, was I'd great. like to thank you once again for joining us. And again, his is you can hit him Twitter. Hit him Twitter. Hit him up at Twitter. At you can punch don't him. Don't hit him. Tim Schmoyer or YouTube, which is the place where he makes his living. So support him. He can be found Video Creators TV. Thanks so much for listening, guys. It was great. I love it. I learned so much about YouTube. I really did. Roland, you didn't know anything about YouTube. I don't know. That's why I was like, I don't know what to ask this guy. That's why I was like, very honest, like, I know nothing. Thank you. I learned a lot. And I just asked whatever. I kind of finally felt like I could work. <laughs> and we'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>
guys, are we gonna wrap this up? Just, just give I us a minute. I got real work. Just too. give us a minute. Gotta keep the lights on. Hold on, I'm calling. What's this number?